Well, let's get in, in the word. I want today, um, the topic today is um, the earthly impact of a heavenly perspective. And we're going to tackle uh, the chapter, chapter 3 of Colossians. Okay, We're going to look at the first 11 uh, verses, Colossians 1, uh, 3, 1 through 11. And uh, the ESV reads as follows. If you then have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, and then he gives a list, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, and evil desires, and covetousness, and, which is an idolatry. On account of these, the, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too was, once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Look at the list again. Anger, wrath. Malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self as it's, uh, and it's with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here... Um, uh, here, um, being here, there is uh, no Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave free, but Christ is in all, in, in, in all. Again, um, we're going to look at the first um, uh, 11 uh, verses and. Um, uh, Colossians is basically um, written in two seg segments, chapter 1 and chapter 2, where Paul kind of tackles the theological implications of what it means to be in Christ, right? And then chapters 3 and chapter 4, he applies what he taught in both the um, first and the second chapter of the letter. And so we're going to enter now into more practical things. And so uh, I want to divide these 11 verses into two segments as well. The first uh, four verses um, teaches us about being resurrected with Christ, seeking the things of heaven. In 1990, when I applied uh, um, with my wife as, as missionaries, uh, they interviewed me um, and I was asked a list of questions. And they said that there were the questions were both were um, a list of questions that were personal matters and then doctrinal matters. And so, um, but they said that um, if I if all the questions um, at some point uh, if I didn't know the answer I had to let them know. And so I. You know, they went through a whole list of questions, very personal questions about, for instance, immorality. And this is sort of the list that they used. You know, do you have a problem with this and that? And I had to sort of, you know, explain to them if I did or not and to what degree. And so um, um, Jim, who was interviewing me, um, was taking notes, just hearing me out. And, you know, I was as honest as I, as I, as I could. And... Um, um, and that was it. So I, I kind of felt like, okay, so I, I you know, I responded um, assertively. I was honest with my, my answers, and I knew what to respond. Um, but um, the doctrinal segment was a little more difficult. My interviewing began, you know, again, the segment by saying, okay, so if at any point in the doctrinal segment your answer is no, you have to stop um, 
and let me know because we have to give you a course in that area. These are important aspects of doctrine that you have to learn, you have to know, you have to manage in order for you to be an effective missionary. And so, um, anyway, to, to, to make the, the, the long story short, it took me about a week just to get through that list of questions because there were some questions that I didn't quite know how to how to say it, how to articulate them. It was like I knew them, but I didn't know how to articulate them in a biblical manner, in a way that it made sense. And so I want to, I want to start, uh, um, I want to ask you four questions, okay? About, that, that essentially summarize some of the things that we just read in verses one through four, okay? But if at any point your answer is no, that means you probably need a course, you need training, you need to learn. You need to relearn those things in order for you to articulate them because these, um, these answers should be, as they, as, they say, as they say, in the top of your tongue. They should be you should be ready to, to answer them. The first question is, do you know what it means to be raised with Christ? Yes or no? It's not a maybe. It's yes or no. If not, then you need instruction. All right, so assuming that you understand what it means to be raised with Christ, the second question is, could you explain it to someone, who, could, or rather, could you explain to someone when and how you were raised with Christ? Can you explain that to someone? Now, the first one is doctrinal. The second one is more testimonial. How, how, how does that work? How is that applicable or, or being applied or has been applied to you, right? All right. Third, if you can explain to someone how and when you were raised with Christ, what things that are above is Paul referring to? That's the third question. Now, if you know what things above Paul is referring to, can you lead someone to seek those things? See, I asked you a doctrinal question and then an applicable question. Both, I mean, all, all, you know, two, two doctrinal questions, two applicable uh, questions, right? So, if you can lead someone to seek the things that are above, um, but this person asks you uh, what it means that your life is hidden with Christ, you know, in God, what, what would you say? How would you articulate that? And in verse 1 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. The, notice that the ESV begins with, with the word if. Um, if. Um, the word if in the original, is, is an if, it's a conditional if. What it's saying is that if A is true, then B is true. Remember math, right? That is why the, the, the ESV translates, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Now, the NIV does not translate. It interprets it as follows. It says, since then you have been raised with Christ. In, in other words, the, the, the NIV assumes that the reader has been born again when, you know, the, the, when in fact the original is rather asking a question. It's not assuming that the, that the reader has been raised with Christ. It is asking. See? And so... When we come to the Word of God, and the Word of God sometimes makes these, these you know, we, we read these questions. And we need to answer. You know, one of the things that I do when I read the Scriptures, I, you know, I, again, I, I read it all the way through, just, just to read it, read it, read it. And one of the things that I uh, understand or try to understand the Scripture is every statement that it makes, I ask myself, you know, I ask myself, do I know the answer? Right? And so it forces me to think. Not necessarily to go in depth, just for application, right? 
Now, if you, my dear friend, if, you're, uh, if you have not raised, been raised uh, with Christ, then you need to first do the following. You cannot do B unless you do A. First, you need to acknowledge Christ as your Savior. Right? That's the first, first step. The faith is to acknowledge Christ as your Savior. But that's not enough. Second, you need to surrender your will to the Lordship of Christ. See, it gets a little testier, right? Because a lot of people acknowledge Jesus as the Savior. Right? There's a country that is called the Savior, right? <laughs> that they acknowledge the Savior, but does that mean that everyone in that country is saved because they, they acknowledge the Savior? No. So, no, you need to surrender your will to the Lordship of Christ. And so Paul is saying, is saying if indeed you have Acknowledge Christ as your Savior, and we can say that. And if you have surrendered your will to the Lordship of Christ, then you can seek the things above. Third, my friend, not only do you have to acknowledge Jesus, not only do you have to surrender your will to Him, but third, you must be baptized. Now notice, I'm not talking about salvation. I'm not talking about getting your name written in heaven. I am talking about being resurrected because resurrection has to do with lifestyle. With how we live our lives. That's what it means. So being resurrected with Christ, in fact, was the pivotal point of of chapter 2 as as we read before, we studied. Here in chapter 3, it it is represented. Now, I I love the, the word that Paul uses. He uses the word synergyro, from, you know, from where we get the word synergy. Have you heard, heard of the word synergy? Synergy Synergy describes the mutual beneficial relationship between two parties. Often, one strong and one weak. But together, right, together, their, their life after they come together is powerfully better than before. So, Paul is using this idea that our relationship with, with Christ is synergetic. It is, it is empowering. So if we call Jesus our Savior, our lives should demonstrate every single day that indeed He has been resurrected. Why? Because we live as resurrected people. It means that we must continue to be transformed. Every day that we come, especially to church or to your community group, we need to ask ourselves, did, did, was there any change this past week but if our life was boring as a week before or just as as, you know the same way then then I would say maybe we're not living the resurrected life Mm -hmm. we were dead in our trespasses and sins we in other words we were now picture this we were we were zombies of sin that's what we were we were dead and still our good works were dead because we did them without Christ. Without the life of Christ, right? But then, those of us who acknowledge Jesus, who surrender our wills to Him, listen, then when we gave our life to Him, God made us alive together with Him. And that's why every Sunday when we come, it's the Lord's Day because because we remember the resurrection. Every single Sunday we come to church, we remember that Christ was resurrected. It reminds us that we are alive. Yeah. And so following that logic, if you have been resurrected with Christ, then act as resurrected. That's the point. If we are alive, then live. Live according to that who resurrected you, which is Christ. That's what it, that's, that's the logic of it, right? And so for this reason, Paul tells us, seek the things. What things? The things that are above, right? If we then before coming to Christ, we had the proclivity to sin. Now we need to have a proclivity to seek the things that are above. If we are resurrected. Because Coming to Jesus is not, it's not a mental exercise. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not an academic um, uh, aerobic. 
It's not some kind of, okay, first, second, and third, like what I just asked you about, you know, to, to, uh, you know the questions that I asked our, our friends. It's not about saying first, second, and third. It's more than that. It's not just about doing, going through the motions, if you will. It is about Jesus moving our hearts in the direction of the things that are above. If we acknowledge that we have been resurrected with, with Christ, then, you know, then and only then, Paul makes a reasonable assumption. All believers must be doing the things that are above or they're not believers. Either you are or you're not. That's what Paul is saying. If you have been resurrected. That's a great thesis, right? Paul is not saying that we should walk around um, you know, with our heads in the clouds either. Oblivious you know, to our earthly priorities. That's not what he's suggesting. Now, it is true that sometimes you feel the presence of God, right? And you, you feel, and you know, what, man, what a, what a sweet is, God's presence is beautiful. Have you had those times? Or maybe you're reading your Bible and you, you, just have, you know, the, I mean, God is always with you, but, but it's like, like he's saying, hey, shh, I am here, right? And, and you feel his presence. I mean, that's beautiful. Yeah, that happens, of course. But what Paul is saying is that although there are many things in life that we can pursue, we need to understand that pursuing heavenly things is the most important things that we can do, and therefore we should devote our time and energy to them. Our time and energy should be focused on the things that are above. Oftentimes, I, you know, when, I, when, I, when I'm giving um, maybe, maybe uh, you know, advice or counseling, one of the things that I notice in most cases, people are either bitter or sad or angry because they're focusing on the things that are below. They're focusing on the things that are on earth. They're trying to fix the earth instead of focusing on the things that are above. Because when we focus our attention on the things that are above, guess what? It's not that the things below disappear, it's that they become tertiary, secondary and tertiary. Now question, what are some of the most common things that people around us are seeking after? Now think of your friends, think of your co-workers, think of people who don't attend with you, church or, or you know, what, what, what common things are, are they seeking? What are they after? Now, in contrast, what higher things should you be seeking? Right? I venture to say that, I venture to say that, if we just look at the world and we do precisely the opposite of the world, we'll minimize the risk. Just, just by that, using that principle. And how can we then seek the things that are above? Well, let me, let me give you some application here. To our finances, we can build the kingdom of God instead of building our own little kingdom. It doesn't mean that you don't put away for your retirement or you don't prepare for those days. It, it doesn't mean that. It just, it just means, in fact, if you're concerned about your retirement, why are you concerned about your retirement? What do you want to do when you retire? People just want to check out. That's what they are. That's not seeking the things that are above. If I ever retire, I want to retire so that I can do, I can give things to the things that I enjoy the most. Now, I assure you that as a pastor, I love pastoring, but I don't enjoy everything about pastoring. There are some things that I love to do, right? So, so we can, you know, through our finances, we can build the kingdom of God instead of building our, our, our own little kingdom. Through our witnesses, we can bring our friends to Christ, right? 
That's thinking of th about the things that are above through our strength. We can serve our church, our family, not ourselves. And we can start today. When we get home, right? If you don't do the dishes, do the dishes for someone. Do a favor for someone, for maybe your family member, your wife, your spouse. Pet your little dog and do something good, but do something productive. Instead of just being bored behind the TV and checking out, vegging behind it, right? Through our calendar, we can prioritize attending a community group or, or worship services. In fact, if you look at your activities this past week, you will know where your heart is. What are the things that you did this past week? Were they things that were above or were you more concerned about the early things? See, today we can, we can begin to change our priorities giving place to the things that are above. Luke um, 12, 34, um, Jesus says that wherever our treasure is, there too is our heart, right? Remember that? Mm -hmm. I was telling you about my, my trip to Mexico and Guatemala, but last uh, um, uh, September 1st, um, after you know, driving seven hours through you know, the mountains, down to the mountains, up again to you know, Guatemala City, um, and, uh, and having dinner with my friend uh, Guillermo Kech. Uh, I, went, uh, I went to, uh, to, to bed and knelt before God. And uh, as I knelt, as I gave thanks to God, I felt a deep longing to be home and to be with you guys. I mean, I love my wife and I love you, but I had this deep longing. I really, I wanted to be here. Like, I wanted to snap my fingers, just be here. I, I, I really longed for all of you, my family, for you. That's how we should long for the things that are above. See? We should be longing for them. We should be like, like sad that we're not there yet, but we're getting there somehow. We should feel a similar longing for the things that belong to God. And that's why 1 Peter 2.11 tells us that, 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 that we are only pilgrims. This is not our home. This is not our home. If you can turn to someone, can you tell them you don't belong here? Tell them you don't belong here. You don't, mm -mm. You don't belong here. As handsome, as, as beautiful as you are, you don't belong here. No, there's a better place for you. One day a newcomer uh, visited the house of an elderly missionary in Upon entering the, the house, a young convert was surprised to see that uh, this old missionary only had a frying pan, a table, a chair, a bed, and, and a Bible. And it, the house was pretty empty. So the young man asked him, Brother missionary, um, where, where, where's the rest of your furniture? To which the missionary asked him, where is yours? Mm. So the young man responds, but I do not, I don't live here. I'm, I'm only a visitor. I'm just passing through. And so the old missionary said, I am not from here either. I'm only passing through. We get our lives so busy with things we don't need to impress the people who don't care what we have. Our life. Greed and envy, right? Greed to earn those things that certainly we, by, you know, just by merit, merit we, can, we can gather stuff or envy to, to want the things that we don't 
haven't, we haven't worked for and we want to have them. And those are earthly things. And we need to remember that. But, but more than, than things, you know, Satan uses the things of this world to divert our attention from the things that are above. I mean, he used the fruit to seduce Eve. He used a, a bar of, of gold to deceive Achan. He sent Delilah to distract Samson. He used Bathsheba to cause David to fall into adultery. And he used money to seduce Judas. My question is, what is Satan using to divert your attention for the things from the things that are above? What is keeping you for the things that are above? What secondary things are occupying your time and your energy? What things are stealing your joy? Things that maybe you don't need. They're not a necessity. And then you fuss about those things. If you're single, loving <clears throat> the things that, of this world is like falling in love with the prostitute at the corner when you're driving over to your fiance's home. That's what it means. If you're married, loving, loving the things of this world is like falling in love with a witch when you have a beautiful wife waiting for you at home. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, many have succeeded too in, 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 you know, in choosing the things that are above. For instance, Noah set his mind to the things that are above when he built the ark. How about Joseph? Joseph sent it, you know, he, he, he set his mind on the things that are above when he ran away from fornication. And, and Daniel set his mind on things that were above when he resisted the political pressure of his day. And Jesus set his, his mind on the things that are above when he told Satan, It is written. See? And so we ought to keep our minds on the things that are above. That's, that's what it means to be resurrected with Christ. Dead to the things on earth, alive to the things that are heavenly. And that, and that perspective can help us enormously. The second thing I, I find here is in verses 5 through 11 which is dying to the things on earth. Dying to what things? Ah, on earth, right? And look at the list in verses, particularly, you know, five, five, six, seven. It says sexual immorality, right? The, the first step. Now Paul goes, goes into application, right? He says these things are earthly. Sexual immorality, pornea, right? Any sexual act that is beyond the boundaries of God's freedom. And then it goes on to say impurity. A catharsia is, is the word. It is the word from catharsis. It, it, it's an impulse. It's sexual filth. Right? The people who are addicted have have this, this, this acarthasia, it, you know, it, it's impulsive, right? He says, avoid passion, pathos, pathos. Pathos, come, you know, that's where we get the, the word pathology. It's, it's a mental disorder. Sounds familiar today, right? People start thinking bad things, and indeed, eventually, bad things come to them, not necessarily in the form of things, but just their mental health. Often, you know, oftentimes people get, I would say most people get sick in the head because of what they, they think, the thoughts that they allow into their heads. It's not just drugs. That exasperates the thing, but it's, it's, it's also their passion, their, their me mental disorder. If you think that everyone hates you, man, at some point you're going to start believing your own lie. If you think that God doesn't love you, at some point you're going to start believing that lie. 
If you think that you cannot make it through in that marriage, at some point you're going to start thinking you're not going to get through. Passion. But he also says evil desires. Uh huh. Kakos epitomia. You know, you know kakos? Kakos is, is the word for enemy in the New Testament. Kakos. It has to do with the devil. It says kakos epi, epithemia or epithemia. It's diabolical desires. That's what, what, that's what they are. Satanic impulses. Yeah. Covetousness as well, which, which Paul says that it's also idolatry. Why, 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 why is he equating, you know, greed with idolatry? Well, because the idea behind it is that it's someone who uses religion to exploit others. Right? It's exploit peers, people, vulnerable people. Right? With, 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 a reli with religious language. Right? And then, I mean, the text says that the people who practice these things are deceiving themselves. In fact, I know that because in Proverbs 26, verse 11, it says, like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. See? A person who has their eyes on the things that are on earth is someone who is constantly going back to the same sin again, again, and again. And there's no intervention, if you will. There's no accountability. It's just, you know, falling and falling. It's, it's like, you know, the, it's, it's, it's like violence. It's, it, right? Violence. Someone who is violent, you know, beats, hurts, and then apologizes, and then again beats and hurts and apologizes. It's this constant, uh, you know, repetition, right? Well, that's what, what the scripture is saying. I know you guys are, most of you are city slickers, but you know, I come from, you know, I grew up in, in, in a place where, where dogs just roamed around and they did this. I watched dogs eat their own vomit. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, what can a fool do? And, and I'm here to tell you, nothing. A fool cannot do anything to save himself. He only has one option. And Jesus tells us in, in John 3.3, 3, he says, Jesus answers to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There is no other solution. Good habits are good. They're good habits. But they're not enough. Self-help. I'm glad I'm not, people want to, you know, read books on self-help. That's fine. But it's not going to deal with the, with the core issue. It's not going to deal with the vomit. It's not going to deal with the death. Jesus is saying that people, if, if, if a fool wants to become smart and wise, he and she must be born again. Which means... It's a conscious effort. It's a, it's a conscious decision. I want Jesus. What I just said before. I want to acknowledge Jesus. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. And I want to show it by being baptized. That's essentially what it is. In terms of resurrection. When Paul says that it is necessary to die with Christ. In order to be resurrected with Christ. He is referring to being born again. That's what it means. And then, if you're born again, then you live like born again, like babies, hungry for good milk and, 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 you know, crying if it needs to be, but hungry for good milk, growing like a baby. That's what it means. That's what Jesus meant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why die with Christ in order to be born again? Well, verses, you know, verse, verse 6 is... Uh, uh, he, he says, uh, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. That's why. 
We must be born again if, if someone hasn't been born again, has to be born again because the wrath of God is coming. Now listen, listen, listen. I know we're, we're, you know, we're in an age where we want to be nice to everyone, right? Where there's a sports event and now they, they want to give trophies to every kid who plays. That, it doesn't work like that. The wrath of God is, is, is coming on everyone. God is not, God is not going to give his goodness to everyone just because they acknowledge Jesus. There is more than that. It has to be bold, you know, a, a, a surrender to him and a demonstration not to God but to us that indeed someone has been born again, right? The wrath of God is real. Now, we, we, we don't have to be rude, disrespectful, or inconsiderate to communicate that God's wrath will come upon those who practice these things. We don't have to be rude, but we can be honest with them. But we can also uh, tell them that they can avoid this if they genuinely come to the Lord in true repentance to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that you can, you can, you can ask as you say, and you can say it confidently. You, don't, you didn't read, the, you didn't read the, the gospel I want to remind you. It's not your gospel. And that's, that's what we get in trouble sometimes. That we, we want to preach our own gospel. You know, a diluted form of gospel with half truth. Half truth. Paul is saying, don't, don't do that. In fact, I'm gonna, in, in, in a minute, we're going to define what lying means to Paul. Because he uses a very specific word in the Greek. But, but again, we don't, I mean, not telling our friends the entire truth, it's telling them half truth, which from Paul's perspective is a lie. And I'll show you in a minute. Remember, how do we, how can we, how can we do it, you know, effectively? Well, remembering that once we belong there too, once we did those things, once, once in the past, we practiced those things, but now we have been raised with Christ and we can tell them, listen, man, I was as messed up as you are. And the wrath of God was upon me too. But, but I surrendered my life to Jesus and you can do the same thing too. He loves you and he cares for you and he wants to extend life to you. You have a chance now when you have life, when you have a choice. So how do we know that we have been raised with Christ? Because verses 8 and 9 present, listen, present us with a test to prove it. We today can tell if we are raised, we have been raised with Christ. Those of us who have been raised with Christ do not practice these things. Look, look, look at the list that Paul gives us in verses 8 um, and 9. Anger. This is, this is uncontrolled anger. Temper, that's what it is. Now, it doesn't say that we should not get angry. I mean, the, the Word of God says that, you know, Paul you, says later on that, that but we, you know, it's okay to be angry, but not to sin. Anger is, is, is normal. It's like love is normal. It's like hate too is normal. It's part of life. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if, 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 we, if we are using it in, in, God's, in God's way, right? So we know that we, are, we have been resurrected when we don't give place to anger, uncontrolled temper. And then he says wrath, which is, which is really, wrath has to do with, with this, uh, with, with hat and madness. That's what it, that's, that's what it means. It's fervent madness, wrath. And then he says malice. Again, he uses the word kakia, from kakos, right, from the enemy. In, in other words, devilish acts, that's what it means. We know that we are, we have been resurrected with Christ, but we don't practice that. And then it goes on to slander. You know the word 
in the Greek, uh, you know, it's, it's similar as, as the Spanish, very much the same one, and, and also in English, we know that. The, the word slander in the Greek is blasphemia. Blasphemia, that's what it means. It's destroying someone's name without cause. Slander. We, we were, we're, we're, too, we're too free sometimes to give opinions when people are not asking us for our opinion. It's not that we don't have an opinion, but we should learn rather to be, to be reserved about our opinions. Because opinions can become slander. I can tell you a list of incidents that have taken place here in the church that I had to defend myself because they were slander. I was just outright devilish, satanic attack. Slander. Blasphemia. Blasphemy. That's the word that Paul uses. So someone who is resurrected doesn't you know, it's not blasphemous, if you will. Normally, blasphemy, we refer it to God, but it has to do also. It is blasphemous to speak evil of someone without you really knowing what it is and without you being asked to give your opinion. Now, if they ask you to be jury in a, in a court, of course, that, that's a good context. That's why they inform you, you know, what the issue is. And you have, you have to, your opinion comes in, in, in the manner of a vote, right? Guilty or not guilty or whatever, right? Yeah, in that context, yes. We can give our opinion. But slander is dangerous. So if you are resurrected, you're not slanderous. You shouldn't be talking evil about someone. You shouldn't be even giving your opinion about things that you don't even know. You know what I'm saying? If you still do that, I don't know, maybe you're still dead and you're not resurrected. Resurrection power is different. You know, we, we just don't want to do those things because we're too alive to be practicing things from dead people. And then he says, he, he says that, that people, resurrected people don't lie. He says, don't lie to one another. You know what the, the word, again, the word Paul uses is, is pseudomai. Pseudomai is pseudo, it, you, know, you know what pseudo is, is pseudo, it's like a pseudo name or, right, it's, it's half of something. My is lie, or, or, or no, a fact, actually, my has, is fact. So Paul is saying that a lie is half of a fact. Pseudomai. See, oftentimes we think of lies as untrue statements. But for Paul, lie means to tell half of the truth. That's, that's serious business, isn't it? So, knowing that we have been raised with Christ and having died to these things, what, what is left for us to do? Well, I love verses 10 to 11. Paul says, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ in all and in all. Those are the things that we ought to do. Yeah. So let me end with just a very simple question. Let me turn into another direction here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end here. Why do, we like, why do we like Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, and Rocky Balboa? Why do we like those? Why? Okay, I started with something secular. How about, you know, why do we like to read stories like Joseph, Gideon, and David, and Goliath. Why, why do we love those stories, right? Why do we like to hear a sermon about Jesus' resurrection? Well, I think it is because we love 
to see losers become winners. <laughs> That's what it is. We love to see the underdog becomes the hero. That's, yeah. Isn't that true? That's why we love those. We just watch those, those you know. Um, so I want to end with this. Listen, if, if you are a believer, if you have been resurrected with Christ, I suggest to you that this week you start thinking of your friends. Your friends who are losing. And bring them to Christ so they can become winners. But if you have not been born again, if you have not acknowledged Jesus as your Savior and surrendered your will to Him, then today you need to do it. You need to come to Him. Or maybe you have been practicing these things. And you might say, well, I only, it's just one that I struggle with. All right, the same thing. One or all the list, it doesn't matter. One is too many. You need Christ. You need to accept Jesus in your life. Please stand. If you've never acknowledged Jesus as your Savior and you've never surrendered your life to Him, well, today is a day you wait no more. Wait no more. Man, I, I, it's just a, I think it's a great motivator to know that it's not good news that God's wrath is upon those who practice those things. If nothing else, that's a good motivation, I think. But even if you feel good, you're still a zombie. You're still dead in your trespasses and sins. And you need Christ. You need to acknowledge Him and surrender your life to Him.